uh, thank you for coming. My, my name is Peter Christopherson of Coil. This is Simon. Simon I'm Pierce. And I'm Matthew. Uh, these two guys are um, our stage performers at the moment, but they're also performance artists in their own right. And uh, they've been helping us on this present tour, and we will continue to be working with them. Um, thank you for coming. I wanted to talk a little bit about, first of all, about how I got into music, because um, a lot of people sort of ask how, you know, how to start and how, what music means and uh, why we do it, all that stuff. And I think it might help explain a little bit about how, why COIL is what it is and why we do what we do and, and what the form of it is. Um, when I was about uh, 18, I was walking through London and I, by chance, went into a small uh, theatre where there were some, there's a naked woman swinging uh, on a stage and a guy who was also naked, who looked a bit like a woman, who was um, turning a bicycle wheel like a, um, one of those uh, Duchamp art uh, pieces. And I thought that they sort of seemed crazy enough to be interesting, so I talked to them and, and it turned out to be uh, Genesis and, and Cozy from Throbbing Gristle, who was the, the first band that um, we started. What happened was I uh, I got talking to them and uh, their ideas were interesting and seemed to be sufficiently uh, crazy that, that it was worth meeting them again. And, and for a long time we, we worked together in an art sort of commune uh, called Coombe Transmissions. We worked from 1973 till 1976 doing performance art um, for selective uh, art gallery type audiences and it was fun because we'd get on stage and take our clothes off and have blood coming from various parts of our bodies, sometimes real and sometimes not real and it's good now that we continue in this tradition with these guys it feels like um, something important is happening uh, but after appearing at the uh, Biennale and various different art festivals, it seemed to us that we were always simply doing things for <clears throat> kind of like art gallery people. And in a way, art gallery people weren't... Is it kind of booming or is it okay? Does it sound okay? Okay. So maybe I'll hold the mic like that. Art gallery people seem to be kind of pretending and not like real, a real music audience. When you go to a, a rock band or a, 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 some kind of just a regular gig, you get real people and, and you get a real reaction. Sometimes the reaction is totally nothing and sometimes the re everybody goes crazy, but at least the people that, when you play music to them, they react as though, you know, like a, a genuine thing, much more so than in an art gallery where everyone's concerned that they're saying the right thing or they're hearing. To, uh, to be doing and having the right reaction. So, so we got kind of pissed off with doing uh, art performances because we wanted to appear, appeal to, to young people and also to real people. So we, we decided to start a band called Throbbing Gristle and uh, it, that was good. We did, we did some kind of uh, strange sounds that were coupled together with equipment that we could afford, which was none, and uh, the thing about that was that we were making <laughs> the same process with the music of Throbbing Gristle that we had made with our art performances, which was to take a subject that we felt was really important or that we felt moved us or m made us feel special or different or there was some kind of a subject about which there was a resonance, a kind of um, importance, or some quality that made it special. And we made this music uh, not for 
the reaction that it would get, but for the feeling that it gave us. A lot of people nowadays seem to, I mean, I guess not just now, but always, start making music or start making records because they want their friends to approve of them or they want to be seen as musicians or as rock stars or as, you know, groovy people. And it, 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 that doesn't actually interest me particularly. I mean, I'm, it's nice when people say, that was a really good concert, but the important thing is that what, that what we do is the things that we select and the things that we express are chosen to appeal to us and to, to move us in a way, you know, as I say, that's special or resonant or something like that. And Throbbing Gristle and subsequently Psychic TV and up to date it's Coil have all, all of these bands have one thing Common, which is uh, we act as a kind of a conduit or a, a sort of line of communication. It's not the word for conduit. As it's a sort of a, it's almost like it's the stuff's not coming from us. It's coming through us. A channeling, maybe a channeling is, is a kind of uh, sort of it's a bit of a hippie way of putting it. In there's like you know, like when we did time machines, we we used to. We still say that the music came from uh, you know, another planet or from from some kind of transmission from Sirius, and and you know I feel that it is. I, although uh, I have enough experience now to be able to remember the, the process of different concerts and the venue and stuff, I very rarely can remember anything that happened during the concert. Um, and you go into a kind of a trance. I think maybe the audience goes into a kind of a trance too, uh, because we often see people just kind of gazing at and kind of going blank a little bit. But uh, I take that as a good thing, rather than a bad thing. And so the process that um, that started with Robin Gristle and, and continues through through Coil today is, is like a kind of a channeling of the information that we, that we feel is uh, important in the world and important to us. Um, and it's totally and fundamentally different from the idea of making music to entertain or to sell records or to be, you know, an, an important experimental musician. And so it's uh, it's difficult to know how to advise people to start doing that. To go you know, to know how to uh, explain what we do, or explain, or exp or help people to, you know, with listening to our music, because sometimes it's quite unlistenable. It's very difficult sometimes to enjoy a kind of crazy man screaming as as uh, very noisy and discordant rhythms. Uh, assault your ears. But the only thing I can say is that because it comes from the heart, it's not, it's not an intellectual process. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very um, emotional and demanding process. Um, that's, that's a little bit about the process. Uh, the history from the days of throwing gristle is, I don't know if that's interesting or not really, we, we did a series of records that kind of went through a series of phases and we got bored with those and we got bored with each other so we split up and then we did another band and that was boring so we split up. We, we have a very, all of the members of, uh, all the people up here and also ex-members of, of all of the bands I've been in have very low tolerance of boredom. We get bored very easily and um, I'm sure you do too. Uh, so we like to move on and we always like to try and do something new and something that's, that's stimulating. The idea that um, any band could continue to play the same songs for 30 years fills me with complete horror. And it was only two days ago that somebody offered me £20,000 to appear in my original band for one day that I would even possibly consider it, and I don't even know if I will now, but um, 
It's, it's to me, playing the old stuff over and over is stupid. And the, the consequence of that is that of all of the 20 or 30 coil records that you'll find on the table at the back, very few actually are similar in musical style, but they all have the same kind of philosophy of, as we were saying, channeling or somehow interpreting what we see around us and what we see in the world as being, you know, that, that we think is important in a musical or in a sound way. Uh, and from a historical point of view, moving forward into Coyle, uh, John Balance, who unfortunately, uh, sends his apologies, wasn't able to come today for reasons I'll go into in a sec, um, uh, started Coyle in 1982 or 1983, while we were still doing, <coughs> excuse me, Psychic TV. Um, and it was a um, project that he was doing with Jim Thurwell and John Gosling and Min and various other people from uh, that London at that time. And uh, he, since um, he had been a, a kind of a groupie of mine when I was in Throbbing Gristle, he asked me if I would help him do rhythms, uh, which I did, and, and we kind of moved forward from there. And, and, and we were invited to make a record um, by the man who produced Mark Ullman's, not produced, but who, who published Mark Ullman's soft cell records. And so we did. Uh, and Coyle has been a series, gone through a series of uh, years of, of personnel and of equipment and of um, methodology, but has never changed really with the principle of what we do. Um, and I don't think ever will really because the principle of what we do is to be as brutally honest with ourselves and uh, with our subject as possible. Now it doesn't mean to say that we're kind of a um, political group because although we do have political ideas and uh, for those of you for example who saw the last song that we did last night which has uh, quite a strong sort of political uh, position about you know the American reaction to the World Trade Center and, and uh, subsequent kind of bogus war on terror kind of thing that they're doing. At the same time, we don't, we're not really political in the sense of, of uh, going on marches or wanting to, you know, put up banners or to be sort of outwardly like the things like that, whatever. We always want people to think more carefully you know, about issues than it might be possible to do from, from what you read in the media or the paper or newspapers. Um, <laughs> uh, so with the changing um, personnel of Coil, the style of our music changes a lot. Both John and I um, very much appreciate the input of our friends and colleagues and try and uh, you know use and exploit but also share with lots of you know the people who are close to us in order to to bring different flavors and different uh, textures and ideas to the music um, our current uh, collaborators uh, Simon and Fatal Sandra who hadn't who had to go back to England look after his mad mother today. Um, uh, on the last tour, for example, we also used um, Cliff Stapleton, who plays uh, Hurdy Gurdy, and uh, Mike, Mike York, who plays, yeah, who plays bagpipes. So the previous leg of the tour had a kind of more folk, folky kind of feeling, and, and this leg has had a more kind of I see Scandinavian electronic kind of vibe to it. Um, you know, and in the future, although I'm sure we'll continue to work with these people, we may also work with other people if we if we do go on another tour, which at present seems unlikely. <laughs> um, this this may this actually you may you may have witnessed the very last coil tour ever. I mean, I'm sure we probably will do one off 
updates in the future, but um, it may be a historic occasion of probably little interest, but nevertheless a historic one. Uh, so that's a little bit about the history. Um, I did make some notes, actually, one sec. Probably lost the notes. Can't read them anyway. Yeah, I was going to say a little bit about um, the personal cost of of the sort of honesty that, that we like to we like to think that we employ. We, we in any uh, in any band like this, there's it's there it, the way that we work is not from a a, a set or rigid pattern. In other words, although we have when we go on stage, we have a list of songs that we will probably do, and an order that we will probably do them in. On on two nights, those songs may be completely different. One might be on one night; it might be uh, three minutes long, and on another night, twenty. Um, which makes it very hard for these guys because they've got to do stand still or do whatever it is that they're doing for a certain amount of time. Uh, and that difference, and the fact that the the singer who is kind of the front man has to um, express you know not only the idea in the song but also kind of lay himself or herself open to a kind of public scrutiny and observation um, in a way that's much more honest and more open and more personal than uh, many groups whose lead more like an actor, you know, he's like, with the majority of groups you can think that the, the singer is sort of acting the role of himself in a way because he knows the lyrics of the songs and he knows kind of how this character behaves on stage and he just has to repeat the performance each night, whereas with what we do, the performance is, uh, is unique and consequently uh, the sort of stress of, of um, doing that to, you know, in a series of night after night situations and not knowing what you're going to do when you go on stage for the next two, you know, hour and a half or whatever and not knowing how people are going to react to you or whether they're going to reject you or be, you know, entranced or whatever has a, has a big um, effect on the personality and the the life of the people who do it, and uh, presently John, um, uh, although he has an alcohol problem, also has a sort of a, a problem of, you know, dealing with that. And for those of you that are familiar with Robin Gristle, you will know that, that Genesis, in a, in a similar kind of way, you know, once he received that kind of exposure, went kind of nuts, and. There are always, you know, examples of, of other performances that go nuts, that go crazy, but it's it's kind of an occupational hazard. These, you know, these people are uh, revealing themselves just as much as, as Pierce and Massimo reveal themselves physically. Uh, the, the front men of bands like Coil, um, not that there are very many bands like Coil, but for example, uh, do roofs kind of reveal themselves and, and kind of suffer the consequences in a way that is much more like uh, sort of a shamanistic or um, I don't know, in Europe, I don't know, in England there's a tradition of a kind of um, a sort of village idiot or jester who uh, in, in those kind of medieval times would would, would be uh, a kind of a crazy man who would uh, tell stories and and would very often have access to the you know like the head or the king or the queen or whatever of that area and would have all the advantages of being uh, you know rich and famous but at the same time would be an object of uh, kind of ridicule and humor and uh, people would throw vegetables at them and stuff like that and then it's it's not that different really from what from what uh, the lead singer of Coil uh, uh, gets, not that he gets vegetables thrown at him, but uh, yeah, if, if people threw broccoli it might be okay, we could eat it. 
but um, it, it's, uh, it's kind of weird for us, people sitting here at the table, because we sort of have to cope with the, the uh, fallout, you know, of, of the effect it has on, on John. Um, and hopefully after he's got home and uh, had some time to, to calm down and recover, he'll be fine. But you, you don't know, you know, and it's part of the kind of creative process um, that, to me, sometimes it somehow it seems a bit more real and it seems a bit more serious and um, kind of like um, an impressive or significant part of life and part of the creative process. You, you hear about artists, um, you know, who commit suicide or cut off their ears or whatever. And, and, but generally they do it alone and you hear about rock stars, you know, like Kurt Cobain or Jim Morrison or something who die sort of either by suicide or accidentally or, you know, in bad circumstances. And, and because they're entertainers, they somehow, that, they get put into a pigeonhole. But, there are, you know, there are always people that do kind of uh, die in a sort of part of a creative process and, and uh, you know, we need to kind of cherish and, and uh, appreciate those people. That's a bit of a downer, wasn't it? <laughs> um, one of the things, one of the, the, the positive and very good parts of the tour that we just did um, is the, the, uh, the inclusion of Pierce and Masson <coughs> as, as kind of stage, uh, you know, performers and part of the, it's, I mean, some people would say it's a theatrical process, but to me it's much more of a, I mean, I, I hesitate to use the word shamanistic because it's kind of a bit of a cliche. But, you know, when you see, or when you encounter people doing the kind of things that they do on stage in a public place, and not really as part of a kind of a pretentious art performance, but part of um, uh, an exposition yeah, uh, of ideas and of images, um, I, I always feel very uh, moved. And uh, you know, I think that it's a very powerful process uh, that does have a, a through line that leads directly back to to where I started uh, cutting myself on stage or whatever it was that we were doing back then. Um, and I, I hope that the work that we do provides the same kind of inspiration and the same kind of uh, springboard for other people to to make new works just as much as the, uh, the work of William Burroughs or Brian Geisen or uh, Captain Beefheart or any of the people that influenced me when I was a kid. You know, I think that as outsiders, I mean, I don't know if everyone in this room would regard themselves as an outsider, but in some respects I think we all are and we have a responsibility to, to influence forthcoming generations in the same way that we ourselves were influenced as as teenagers or in, in our youth. And that's the kind of the one thing that to me is really important about uh, being a creative person is that we are able to to help and inspire new young people in the way that we were inspired because um, I think probably none of the people on this table and some of the people in this room, you know, are not likely to continue procreating children uh, in, you know, in the way that we were procreated. And so we have a different role, which is to to uh, inspire um, future markets, future people, future kids to do as well or better. Um, so that's basically all I have to say about Coyle, and I'd be very happy to take any questions. Um, and I'm sure everybody on, the, on this uh, table here would be would be able to answer different views or different ideas that people would have about Coyle or about any subject. Good. Okay. Uh, 
I was born in 1976, so I think I was quite like when you, <laughs> I got, when uh, you power. start to have a, like trauma in Bristol or, right. sorry for my being, yeah. 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 yeah, so uh, anyway, uh, when you make um, performance with gun transmission after the trauma in Bristol, um, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. A kind of a continuity uh, about a relationship with public, no? Since 1976 or before, and this is in continuous right now, mm -hmm. now in 2002. So in a way, I'm curious um, if you are in a maybe intimate or personal way, uh, the reaction of the public about what you do. I'm curious to understand if, uh, in a way, this reaction about the public is a um, process, intimate process for you when you create something. In this case, music or performance or about your continuity. If do you, um, my question, I'll try to be clear. <laughs> um, if for you, there was a lot of change about the reaction about public mm. in time. No. Uh, uh, one a big um, misunderstanding sometimes that people have about Coyle and also about Throbby Grizzle was that our intention is to, was to shock. You know, I don't think that it's important to make a big uh, uh, impression on people from that point of view. But um, if you mean, uh, is the reaction important? to us. It's important, but uh, in a secondary way. The most important thing is that the work is true to what we feel, and that's the, the best that we can do. And after that, it's, it's sort of like the reaction is like a fertile ground for new work, you know, because once, once the, the ideas um, uh, begin to, le to leak out into the, into the ground, into the earth, into the world, then the, the reactions of other people provide new uh, inspiration and new source of new ideas and new work. But we don't, it's, it's like the first bit of the work is inside a, a pot, you know, inside like a plant pot. And it goes out and once it's through the barrier of the, of the pot or once it's across the edge of the border, then it becomes a new thing, it becomes something else and it's obviously we you know we think that the, the reaction of people is very important and we're very pleased if people react in a positive creative way but in all, but maybe egocentrically maybe it's very selfish but the first thing is that the work has to be right for us and we would never we never do anything really in order to to make a, re a specific reaction you know, people. I was asked today whether we get influenced by things in, you know, in the world, and whether we do things in the context of the the marketplace of electronic music or experimental music or alternative, whatever. And my first answer was no, because it doesn't really matter what else is going on. But then I did think about it, and, I, and you know, it's inevitable that if you hear the new Aphex Twin record, or you hear an Autechre, or Boards of Canada, or whatever, Parmigiani record, it's, you're bound to be influenced in some way, and so, you know, of course, the, you know, the, the environment has an effect, but it's not, we never do things to achieve a particular reaction. first, it was uh, great to see you yesterday, it was the first time I got to see you. Um, I had a question about translation from the studio uh, to the live setting. Um, are there pieces you find that you've created in the studio or in your own realm that are untranslatable to a live uh, situation? And specifically I was thinking of uh, Moon's Milk. Is that a piece that can be performed live and has it 
Uh, it hasn't. In, in answer to your question, it, there are some things that would be impossible to do live because they involve so much computer processing uh, that at the moment, you know, computers are not fast enough to be able to do that stuff on the fly. Um, we, we only started uh, performing live about uh, two or three years ago now. And the reason for that was that it was simply not possible to do the things that we do until, until then. Um, the, the way that, you know, although we use sounds that are, you know, stored on a drive, stored on a hard drive, the, it was never acceptable to us to just play with a backing track. You know, many, 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 um, you know, so-called uh, spontaneous or industrial or, you know, contemporary bands consistently play with all of the material on a computer disc. And so if anything fails when they're playing live, they can, the sound engineer can switch, you know, from the, the live vocal to the recorded vocal. And it's, to me, it's shocking, you know, that, you know, anybody from Madonna to Nine Inch Nails to any member of any boy band or girl band or anyone that you see on MTV plays live like that, which means that everything they do is the same every fucking day. And it's just always the same. And even, you know, if they're drunk or if they're singing out of tune, you can press a button and get the recorded version. To me, that's totally not interesting. Um, and so the reason that we only started playing live a few years ago was because the technology had just got to the point that um, we could use like, sound loops and recorded, pre-recorded fragments of sound and play them spontaneously enough to produce a, you know, a, a different performance each time and something that you know, was uh, spontaneous and and uh, uh, you know, as powerful as we wanted, and tailored for that specific moment and that specific audience. Um, but, but that only goes so far. You know, the the technology is only so fast, and some of the music that we make depends on many hours of, you know, gigaflops of computer uh, process. You know, to to uh, change the you know, pitches of voices and to program sounds in a way that you know that just you, you could not do live. So so there is a difference between the studio process and the live thing. I mean, maybe in the future, you know, in ten years' time, the computers are going to be ten years, a hundred thousand times faster. Maybe it'll be possible to do more, and there'll be more interesting interfaces. One of my criticisms of, of the technology that we use right now is that um, we're dependent on, on pressing keys in our, or on a keyboard or on a, on a yeah. piano type keyboard and that, that's actually not very exciting to look at you know, I think it'd be much more interesting and you can get interfaces you know that where you can just tap on a table and the sounds come out but I can look pretty stupid too so I don't always use that so. but, but you know the technology is always advancing and, and if, any, if you can rely on Coil for anything, it's that we will always use the most modern technology available to produce an effect that's uh, hopefully unlike what anybody else is doing. A reason to keep on playing live then. Thank you. <coughs> and uh, about using your time, uh, for you, what is uh, the most uh, difference about using uh, analogical equipment or digital equipment? I mean, uh, when you are um, way I'm, ready to make or... Yeah, I'm, I'm personally, you know, some people say, oh, we never use digital, or some people say, oh, we always use digital. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and that's, to me, that's, you know, that's crazy. Because any equipment can be used, you know, kind of to, to do what it's good for. We use a lot of analog sounds. Um, in, in our studio, we have a very big collection of uh, antique and uh, when I say antique, I mean anything between before 1995 is antique. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have a big collection of that stuff. So we like, we like doing both. But to me, it's exciting. Um, when I was in Throbbing Gristle, uh, I, I had one of the first Apple II computers in England. Um, and I was using it to, in 19... 
1980, I think, or 1979, to, it can't have been 79 because they didn't even make apples in 79, but it was like one of the very first ones to come to England. And so I, I, there was a program that you could uh, trigger sound samples from different keys on the keyboard um, that was like a freeware program. But uh, I just had it, you know, I, having got this really expensive, super hi-fi, super everything computer, I was running it through a wah -wah pedal, you know, and a lot of analog stuff and just, you know, I don't think there's any reason to be pure with a particular style of equipment. Just take anything and use, use it wrong, you know, and you probably end up with something that's much better than the reason it was designed for. Uh, speaking of music, uh, let's say the body and performance, what is the difference between a live concert and a ritual? I mean, does it make a difference? Well, <coughs> what do you mean by ritual? Um, ritual in the way of an... in, in an archaic way, in an ancient way. In a way that... Um, Isn't music ancient? Well, this is one of the questions I would like to, to come to. To me, it's all the same, you know. Uh, it's, it's, there are two different kinds of rituals. There's the ritual that the guy in the long dress on, in the big house on the hill, you know, with the pointy bits at the top. There's the rituals that they do um, that usually have uh, you know, in this, this, this part of the world they're Christian, but in another part of the world they may be something else. But those rituals are things that they use, or in the past they've used to control people and to, to tell people that they weren't good enough or that they didn't have enough information to, to be in the power. Um, so that's one kind of ritual, and it's, it's a kind of ritual that I, I don't approve of. But, you know, it's, for me it's dogma, you know. But there's another kind of ritual, which is the things that we think just before we dive into the water of a you know of a swimming race it's the things that you do you know with your hands before you start typing the first page of your novel or the things that maybe a chef you know, maybe the way a chef arranges the knives before he cuts the, the meat or the vegetables or the fish or whatever, the sushi, you know. Those rituals to me are interesting because they are about uh, putting yourself in a different state of mind. It's a bit like putting yourself into a trance, you know, with a hypnotist. Uh, you can, you can uh, focus the attention and put people into a trance. And in doing so, you take them to a slightly different place and you address a different part of the person's mind. And you can do that for yourself. And we do it, all of us, uh, on stage. Uh, before we go on, you know, I'm sure each of us has personal rituals that we just do for a few moments. And the effect of that is to bring yourself into a place where you can do your your creative work more effectively or more powerfully. So, to me, there's no difference between you know ritual and playing live. It's what we do. Because I, I think that trance is the one that the thing that connects these two. Whether you do it private at home to make something like a sound rehearsal, or you you rehearse the show, or whether you do it in front of an audience. So I, I also was interested if this is, let's say, in the idea of what you do in this kind of trance state, if this is something that makes a difference. I think it makes a big difference. If you talk to um, if you talk to a man who uh, shoots, you know, like a. Uh, like a rifle, you know, when you shoot a rifle and you, you know, target practice, and you and they have Olympic teams that that uh, you know are, are to do with 
shooting, you know, over 500 meters or something accurately. If you ask those guys or women, whatever, what it is that they do before they pull, uh, you know, when they're, when they're lining up the gun and uh, they're getting ready to fire and aiming at the target, ask them what they do and they'll tell you, I'm bringing the target closer. And that's exactly the same as what everybody does. It's just we don't think about it. You know, if, if, uh, if we all took the time to, to think about the process of bringing the target closer in our minds, then it would be, you know, we might be more effective in doing any, any job that we do. Does, does that answer the question? <laughs> Hi. Um, I'd like to ask you two questions, actually. So the first one is that um, in the past, like for example, remembering that your anal staircase record, um, you dealt a lot with the subject of alchemy. And I'd like to ask you um, how much that's still relevant and how much you feel you've succeeded in alchemizing musically and um, as a band, as a concept. Um, my second question is the role of sexuality and sex. What does that play? Um, in your performance and in your music because I think going back it's always been quite important and for instance the Austrian newspaper that wrote a review of you yesterday described it as homoerotic which I think is narrowing it down quite a lot I think it goes further than that Simon says it's homoneurotic yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for the questions, they were good uh, They are good um, In terms of number one, um, in terms of alchemy uh, I don't know what to say about that. It's sampling's quite like alchemy, really. You know, um, presuming that, obviously, depending on where you go to sample from, um, you could maybe sample from ELO or or um, Phil Collins or something, and start feeding it into the into your into your own personal systems of filters and and whatnot, and transforming. The electricity into a new shape. Basically, you're saying that Phil Collins is shit. Is that what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you can you can make gold. Of that. <laughs> you know, al alchemy was obviously in the Middle Ages was was um, a kind of forbidden or, or uh, you know um, rarefied art that people regarded with with suspicion and also. Um, jealousy and all kinds of um, you know different motivations, but it was something that was, was separate from the process that most of the common public were involved with. And it, as Simon says, was was to do with um, refining or or, or um, what is it you do with spirits? You know, uh, making more concentrate, concentrating the the distilling. Yes, thank you. The, the, essence, the essence of, of what you're doing and, and in, in a sense that process is still very much a part of what we do because um, although Thaipo Sandra who is not here today is, is classically trained musician the rest of us are not particularly trained and so one of the most important parts of, of, our, of the process of music making is to is, is choice, is editorial control if you like because we take things as diverse. I mean, I personally don't use um, ELO samples, but you could do. Um, and and you, you kind of, very often we uh, sort of almost randomly mutate things, or, or not randomly, but in a sort of uncontrolled and kind of spastic way. We make sounds disappear and go up their own arseholes and loop and become something else, and then choose out of an hour's worth of noise, you know, the 30 seconds that might actually contain the distilled essence or the beauty or the, the essence or the, the, the meaning of what it is we were trying to get at. So the alchemical process is, you know, in a, it's, it's symbolic really of the kind of, of a musical process that we, that we employ. So it's still, you know, it's still very much part of our work. And uh, it's flattering to us that we get, we frequently um, get invited by British TV companies to sort of 
provide soundtracks for programs about Alistair Crowley or, you know, John Dee or Rasputin or any kind of weird kind of character. Um, but th that seems to happen quite a lot right now. Um, so hopefully that answers your first question. In terms of the second question, sexuality, I mean, to me, sexuality is important to everyone and it doesn't, you know, the particular uh, sort of flavour or, or, or kind of sexuality is not as important as the kind of bacchanalian or the kind of unrestricted uh, enjoyment, you know, that, uh, that, that everybody experiences when they reach a transformed state. Um, you know, the, the state of, of a sexual um, ecstasy or orgasm is, you know, it, from, from our very first record we, we sort of made a parallel between the sex and death and although that's kind of a cliche in a Woody Allen way, it is also true. Uh, and not to, to be as open about that in our own lives and our own personalities would, would be, you know, would be to hide something and hiding anything, you know, the consequence of, of any kind of secrets or lies, if you like, uh, is, you know, misery. You, it's only when you're totally open, first of all, with your friends, and secondly, with, you know, your parents, I guess, and thirdly, with the listening public or the, you know, your, your audience. It's only when you're completely open with them that you can actually know that, uh, you know, what you're doing is true and therefore people see that what you're doing is true and are that much more powerfully moved. And we're all completely mauve. No. <laughs> no, I don't think that translated probably does it into German, but, <laughs> but uh, yes, it's true that uh, uh, sex is important. So we're going from here to, where are we going? <laughs> Some uh, some kind of porno shop, I don't know. <laughs> How do the boys feel about that? How do they feel when they're on stage? Yeah. Oh, you know, I feel I feel quite uh, quite comfortable. I mean, uh, uh, the sexuality and uh, a bit of exhibitionism. Uh, it's my cup of tea, so doesn't make a big deal to me. I feel good. Did you feel good too? I loved it. Oh. <laughs> well, sexuality is, is a sin for, for more than 10 years for me, a uh, thing. I worked with it uh, also as a prostitute and it's for me an important thing to, to give to other people sexual energy, inspiration and I think for me, uh, in the performance way, it's like... Uh, the big thing now to, to come together with COIL because this was uh, uh, something who brought us also together like that I met Massimo that uh, was a COIL reason too so we fell in love with each other and I think it couldn't be possible without sexuality all this so I think this is the big match again yeah. the thing is if you're open and if you're open in public, um, and if your openness spreads and is seen to be acceptable and not a danger, then other people will see it. And it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight or whatever, whatever your sexuality, the important thing is that you're open and comfortable with yourself, as these guys are, and we are too. And, you know, it's bound, it's inevitably bound to have a kind of um, continuing as Pierre said, magical connection so that, you know, people meet at a car concert or people, you know, happen to see that there's the, the, some guy they went, went home with has a coil record or anything like, any connection like that, or a poster or some, you know, those connections spread, as I said, like spread throughout the world and actually, you know, help. Someone else? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, you 
you had mentioned earlier that um, uh, you act as a medium to music. Uh, do you think that's informed historically or something outside of the world we live in, or is it both? How do you mean? Um, Historically, as in folk traditions, you mentioned you had a hurdy-gurdy player, bagpipe player. These are specifics to a region, uh, a type of musical tradition. Um, is it informed in that regard more, or is it something also, you had mentioned time machines, where it was music that um, had no kind of direct parallel in this world, uh, or is it, is it both? <laughs> I think it's just you know it's just a case of going to what to the most relevant place for just how you feel in terms of sound. Um, the hurdy gurdy it, it was used in France, England, Czechoslovakia. You know it's it's more. It, it, I mean it was interesting for us to bring in a more kind of organic sound in with the electro electronic work that we were doing to make some, to make it sound more I guess kind of more warm in a way um, so yeah but I don't think it's informed in the sense of an intellectual kind of musicology kind of way because you know we're all Philistines sort of at least I certainly am uh, although we we probably have an extremely wide CD collection it's just so that we can take things you know, and steal them, and uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe more. In, in you know, it's like it's just um, you know, uh, for for six months or a year, you might use a lot of paprika, you know, in your cooking, and then suddenly you get bored of that and decide to use oregano or whatever. It's, you know, I think it's. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you if you thought about where that came from. I think we do after the event. You know, quite often that we'll we'll be using something, or s certain themes will will be you know appearing over and over in the music that we kind of when we're creating music, um, or you know certain uh, types of rhythm or types of sound or types of instrumentation will be appealing for reasons that we're not immediately aware of, and, and because we're just listening. <coughs> to a, a sort of inner voice, uh, it's not until afterwards that we suddenly make the connection between what it is we're doing and something else that we've been working on or some other thing. Uh, you know, a, lo a, lot of, a lot of mental activity, uh, you know, we, we always think of our mental activity in terms of pictures that are appearing, in, you know, up here or sounds that we're hearing, you know, people go, What's it, what is it? What would it be like if you did this? And someone goes, mm, well, it would be like this, and they're looking at it that way. Or they go, and, and how would it sound if you took, a, you know, a lion and you played it backwards and you pitched it down, and, and you go, mm, well, it would sound something like this. And all, all this mental activity is sort of taking place at the front, but in fact, um, a large proportion of, of what Coyle does takes place, you know, in the back, at the back of your mind, and. Uh, to, to me, the um, the activity of the unconscious and the subconscious is, is uh, just as interesting and many times more interesting than you know the fact of of um, that filter being you know having a cue of this and that whatever you know there's you can you can focus you know you can focus on a piece of paper and if you're not blind like I'm you could read the words and. <laughs> And the foreground of your thinking can be taken up with what's on the paper, and um, at the same time, there's all these other things that are going on, you know, in the back. And it's the same for everyone. And, and so, in answer to your question, the, the the reason that we we choose to go with a particular kind of instrumentation or a particular kind of lyric or a particular rhythm, whether it's a you know, four-four marching rhythm, where it's kind of some sort of samba or something, is often not immediately clear to us, but we just do, and then later, you know, reasons or excuses or whatever present themselves. So uh, it's, it's uh, always we try and be open to 
to any influence. Um, and the downside of, of being open to any kind of artistic influence is that you get seasick. <laughs> so you have to take a lot of Dramamine or, you know, you have to try and not throw up too much, but it doesn't always work. Um, I have a question. Oh, I'm over here. I have a question about y'all's communication on the stage last night. I was there watching you, and um, just to see how, how much was created then. I was seeing, oh, is he looking at him because this is going to happen next, and the eye contact and the movement and, 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 and the very tightness of the group was evident. Um, but just how much, how much happens up there, they're just saying, oh, let's continue this riff for another word for yeah. five more minutes. That was very intriguing to me. Oh, thank you. Um, it is basically, the main, the main bit of communication that happens visually is, is basically when I'm trying to encourage them to carry on or shut the fuck up. Because <laughs> um, they, they can generally tell when I'm slowing things down or, or kind of winding things up or when I'm getting more involved in it. And uh, be, you know, because the, the other members of the band are kind of um, uh, maverick spirits, very often they, they'll carry on, you know, if they're into something. That, you know, beyond time when I would have otherwise have drawn things to a close, and that's sometimes fine. Sometimes, you know, if they're getting in a groove, they'll they'll come up with something else, and I'll just go okay and bring the rhythm or whatever it is back in, or bring something else. It's it's a it's um it's a process that that you know the only word for it is improvisation in English, but to me that's a very uh, that word has a lot of uh, baggage, you know, of of jazz and. Uh, Kinds of music that actually don't improvise, don't, don't interest me very much because they, you know, they suggest a kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, whimsical sort of self, uh, just, just, you know, they, they don't, they don't. It, it just suggests a lot of um, kind of twiddling around. Whereas I would like to think that what we do is not twiddling around, but actually has some kind of, you know, f physical effect, and you know, that actually moves people, mind, body, and spirit. So, I uh, hope that answers your question. But thank you for that. If, if I go to see a, another musician or an, a, a band or a classical concert, the, the appearance of the artist is, is just as important as the music and it's everything, everything is a complete experience. You know, this right now, you know, we're feeling the, the effect of the chairs or the, of the wall or whatever. And, uh, you know, you're seeing and hearing what I'm saying and in, in a, on stage, it's true that you could hide in the orchestra pit, but that would be the same as a radio broadcast. You know, people who come to see Coil come for the entire experience, and, and you know the, the, that brings me to another thing, which is the the video screens and the, all the presentation is is just as important as the music because it has, you know, it affects a different part of the brain, but to the same ideal to the same end and for me it's important to, to use as much as possible it, it will work quite often not not yesterday but sometimes we use um, incense you know burning on stage to to affect the the nose and uh, other kinds of uh, smells and you know we would like to, at some point we plan to um, have people distributing like a communion wafer, you know, that they give out in church on one side of the stage and a small capsule on the other side of the stage. So you can choose, you know, whether to have a chemical experience or a religious experience. <laughs> <laughs> or both, indeed. So, uh, you know, I think that the, for any performer, their appearance contains information, you know, body language and, uh, and uh, movement and... I mean, I get an impression from you the same as you get an impression from me, and those things are a part of communication. You know, it's a cliche that only 7% of, of our communication is through words, and the rest is, you know, on some other visual or psychic level. And I think that's true.
So the, every, the whole performance is important to me. And you know, uh, Piers and Massimo are part of the present uh, style of quail performance and a very important part. Thank you. Um, I was uh, very curious about that because, first me, I'm uh, quite ignorant about what you make. Um, but yesterday was me, um, the person with me, and um, she didn't know quite at all about what you make. Uh, maybe uh, so, and uh, uh, she said that um, she appreciated a lot the stage, for example, uh, Massimo. And Sorry, I don't know the name. Yes, anyway, <laughs> but uh, she felt a lot of deep sensation, and for me it was interesting because she said that, in a way, for uh, nice for her to close the eyes, for uh, see clear what she felt. So um, I'm interested about your attitude for a huge unbalance and you and other and. Massimo yeah. and the other, yeah. Um, what is the relationship about visual, about image? Because of course, and sorry if I talk about maybe cliche for people here. I don't know. Anyway, um, in our society, of course, there is a lot of pictures and stuff like that, and of course, the discussion is very open and mm. system of art and stuff like that. Um, do you have a kind of a deeper relationship about? Uh, the idea of time or pictures and when you make that on stage, for example. I don't ask if bothers you because of course, like you said, all it's important, no? I, th I think every aspect of, of, the, of the performance is, is, is important, yeah. And, and in answer to your question, I do have a very strong um, uh, sense of, of uh, visual uh, attention, you know, the, the videos that we use in Coral and um, the work that I do privately of my own is, is uh, <coughs> basically it, it just uses the same editorial uh, sensibility in pictures as we do in sound. Uh, the, to me there are, there are so many images in the public, you know, we're constantly bombarded by television and posters and Pretty soon we'll be bombarded by posters that move, you know, and it'll be even worse. And so, you know, it's important to be able to edit out when you get too much information. And it's interesting, particularly uh, female um, members of our audience seem to appreciate um, our music with their eyes closed. We had a situation um, in Amsterdam when we played there last year where. Uh, a young couple decided to get married at a coil concert. <laughs> uh, seems like an odd thing to do, but but they did. And and uh, the young the the bride was standing right at the front, in front of the monitors, and they, the the groom, uh, her husband to be, was was standing next to her, and the, and the person who was going to perform the ceremony. And they were right at the front, and we had a um, uh, bubble machine, you know, like a hippie bubble machine, blowing bubbles. And the music was, it was very loud, it must be said, it was, uh, it was in um, Paradiso in Amsterdam. And uh, just as, as she was about to say, I do, the woman fainted. She collapsed on the floor because of the, the total kind of psychic and uh, emotional reaction. And her husband, you know, was, was very worried about it. He carried her out of the building um, and, and put her down on the sidewalk and uh, was trying to revive her, you know. She came round. She came round, and she recovered. And immediately, she realised she was out on the pavement. She ran back into the venue uh, and came back down to the front. And unfortunately, they didn't complete the ceremony that day. But but she said she had a great time. And I think I believe they're, they're still married. Okay. Thanks. Maybe another question to uh, Massimo. And, uh, yeah. uh, if it was, uh, I don't have the right words right now. Or comfortable or. I don't know. You speak German? How, yeah. Speak German. Or Italian? Italian. Italian. Or Italian. Yeah. Eh. Uh, Come è stato per, per te, per lui, mh, avere questa, mh, questo rapporto interpersonale con loro? O meglio, mh, no? Sentire quello che loro hanno da, da far sentire e tu 
con lui quello che devi far sentire on stage perché è quello che da un lato fai con lui no? come è stato per voi so. oh, uh, we, we met on a personal level and uh, just tell us what yeah it's about, it's about uh, how does it work uh, the personal relationship and the professional or artistic relationship okay. we met on a personal level and uh, we fell in love with each other we like each other and so we said let's work together I think I think you should say if, if, if it works. I, I think so. I feel I feel good in in, in it, and I also have emotions. And uh, every every night is different. Yesterday night for me was very very deep, and I was I was very involved in it. And tears are running out. Yeah, I was crying for uh, most of the time. Yeah, and uh, I think I think things uh, work when when there is. Uh, there is a, a strong connection with, with the people you, you work with. Otherwise, it's work and it's going there and do something. That's my point of view. Yeah. Um, I, th I think it's true that you can, you can have a very strong working relationship with somebody that you are in a relationship with. Um, I, I was in a relationship with John Balance for 20 years. You know, and so we're consequently we have a very strong understanding of what's on in each other's minds. But uh, the the problem with that is that uh, sometimes it's not good to know what's in everybody in you know, your partner's mind. It's good for work, but it's not necessarily good for the relationship. So uh, you know, I would say to them, be careful. You know, don't get too close. I don't know if there's, if there's one more question, we probably should uh, be moving along. I don't know if anybody else has got anything. Okay. One more question about the musical side of things. Because <clears throat> you mentioned before that the music of Croyle has constantly been changing over the years and you've worked with different people and the personnel has you know, been keeping changing. Why do you sometimes, like for the Elf, the Blacklight District, like use a different moniker when it's always different anyway? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's well, the difference between person, yeah. the Elf and Croyle? the other projects, or is there a difference? I, at the time, we were concerned that people would, would um, if, we, if we use the name Coil, people would buy the record and um, somehow feel that it wasn't, you know, that it was uh, in false pretenses or, you know, that it was somehow that it was trying to deceive, you know, it wasn't Coil enough, you know, because um, at that time, we, we'd done the Horse Rotavator and Scatology and Love Secret Domain, and all those three records were quite kind of recognizable and quite s strong in their sound and in their uh, ideas. And um, the Elf record and the Black Light District record were, were kind of a departure from, from the thread, from the idea. And so we didn't want people to think necessarily that this was the next coil record. But now, I f you know, I feel less worried about that, you know, people, you know, most of you guys know how we do things and, um, you know, hopefully will appreciate the, the idea behind it or the philosophy or the, our, our personalities in the record, even no matter, uh, now, you know, a coil record could be one note if it was a really, really good note and that would be fine and I'd be quite happy to call that coil, but at that time I was more concerned that you know people would be expecting to have ten songs and there'd be some songs about death and some songs about alchemy and some songs about sex you know. <laughs> <laughs> but now, fuck it, I don't care so that, that I don't know if anybody uh, wants to ask anything else, I'm going to be around here probably at the bar uh, for for a while, and if anybody needs anything, you know, signed or whatever, we'd be delighted to do that. This, as I say, this is likely to be the last coil tour of in this particular uh, style, certainly, and in this format, and probably the, possibly the last coil tour ever. Although we might, we have a few um, individual uh, appearances booked for next year. So it's absolutely the last opportunity for you to buy any of the merchandising at the back of the <laughs> back of the auditorium.